field. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, I was a student in chemical engineering at Caltech. Uh, and I, <coughs> I was eager. <laughs> but I can't. Uh, there must be something I can do. Uh, with my training, to help in war effort, and I thought, and I knew chemical uh, warfare was never taught. I, we didn't even consider that feature. I didn't realize that was a possibility until they put a gas mask on me and made me walk through this building filled with uh, some noxious <laughs> stuff. But uh, in any case, I thought, well, uh, photography, uh, that might be it. And I saw a brochure come around today. <coughs> Enlist in the Army Air Corps uh, and uh, become an area photographic cadet. So I applied. I went up. Uh, this was a th that summer. I went up to Trona, a place in the desert uh, where they mine Torox and other things as a chemical sampler. And about two weeks later, I got an answer. Your application to become a meteorological cadet has been accepted. They were looking for anybody with physics and math, and at Caltech, everybody, no matter what your major, has a lot of physics and math. Uh, and so uh, I reported on Armistice Day. It's now called Veterans Day in the fall of 1943, I think it was. Uh, I met uh, uh, another gentleman reporting at the same time. You know, man, Robert Reed, who later, who I spent the rest of the war with, uh, and uh, also went back to school together. Robert Reed became uh, dean of the School of Meteorology and Oceanography at uh, Texas A&M, uh, and is now retired, as are most of us are the same our age. Uh, but. Uh, after we had, uh, we, we both were sent to UCLA, uh, there was a cadet corps there, had lots of, uh, lots of running, uh, setups, all those kinds of things. I can't do the setup today. I was one of the, <laughs> used to easily do 150 at a time. But in any case, uh, after we had graduated at Shavedale for tennis, uh, we were a, a group of us, a small group, about five or six were sent to study under Sperger, who uh, was a Norwegian oceanographer, who had developed a theory on how to forecast the uh, sea and swell uh, based on the meteorological wind field uh, forecast. And uh, we learned to do that, and Bob Reed and I were, and, well, actually four of us, five of us were sent to England. I was assigned to the 21st Mobile Weather Squadron, given a Mobile Weather Station, which had several vans full of uh, equipment, teletypes, and the like. And uh, <coughs> the upshot, two of, two of the fellows were in uh, the Admiralty and were involved in, in uh, briefing Eisenhower on the CS-12 in the in, along Normandy, and uh, Bob Reed and I ultimately were sent to uh, put on a vessel with our uh, weather, mobile weather station with the Akinaga command ship of the First Army, which was the Army of the First Army in. And we took that mobile weather station ashore in Normandy on D plus two, forecasted there for some time uh, under the uh, technical, we were advisors to the Corps of Engineers that ran the beaches. Uh, in any case, uh, after the war in Europe was over, uh, we uh, were sent to, uh, to uh, Pearl Harbor, well, actually to Schofield Garrison, Hawaii, plant for the invasion of Japan. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, that uh, Nelson talked a little about the formation of the CBI. <coughs> Uh, I always thought that uh, I really appreciated Nelson because I thought here he had such a small budget he could well probably commit 30,000 of it to, to this new organization. 
Uh, and uh, and I, I know that when uh, when Hargis cut off our funds some time later, he he said he couldn't afford it. <laughs> so it was taking out of his budget. Uh, Marsha was the one that told me, no, that wasn't quite so. <laughs> but in any case, we had $90,000 out of which uh, we built a new ship in the first year of the morning after Matthew Fontaine Moore, the first hydrographer of the Navy, and uh, our staff. And in the, I came here in 19, fall of 1948. Uh, I'd been on a joint, uh, I worked uh, for the uh, Navy Electronics Lab, and I'd been on a joint uh, program with um, the um, <coughs> Canadian Navy, uh, target drink the submarines up in the waters between uh, Vancouver and the island uh, and uh, uh, the mainland. And, uh, we were, I was on board a small Navy, uh, Canadian Naval research vessel when a U.S. patrol, in Georgia Straits actually, a U.S. patrol came alongside and was mailed. And then that was a letter inviting me to come back and meet with Nelson, uh, with uh, Reginald Truett, and with Isaiah Bowman, then the president of the Jones Hopkins University, I am a geographer. Uh, and uh, then in the September, of, I mean, in uh, early February of 1949, I moved my family out. I was off the job. Uh, and I might note that we began working using a vessel that we uh, leased from Woods Hole, Redfield, to leased us a vessel called uh, the Valance, a new editor crawler, a big one so we could get on with it. Gene wanted to get, do more research, and I kept saying, Gene, we've, we've got to sometime take the, bite the bullet and give advice as to what, on the basis of what we knew at the time, the best course of action. And there were some things that I think were contrary to what Hart said. We did influence the man. We wanted to do with it. We advised them as what we thought was benefit them. And so I, I had money to do our part. Gene needed $25,000 uh, to do the, the work in the lab. And so the two of us went to the um, Board of Public Works, the Board of Estimates, I can't remember which. Anyway, Governor, Louis Goldstein, the State Controller, and the Treasurer of the, of, of the state form that board and they could dish out money in between sessions, small amounts. So we met with them and I made the presentation that uh, uh, why we needed this money and Louis Goldstein, this had come out of a commission called the Submerged Land Commission, which Dean Cronin and I served on with Louis Goldstein. Uh, I hope some of you know about Louis. He's still our controller. <laughs> Uh, in any case, uh, the governor said, well, you know, I've been interested in this. Uh, and I've been looking at the minutes of the Submerged Lands Commission. And uh, the thing that interests me, this is the first time I've ever known you and Gene Cronin to agree. <laughs> now, that's not quite so. But I, so I said, governor, <laughs> there was a, a Greek philosopher, I think it was Connie the Younger, something like one of those, who said, the role of the philosopher, i.e. scientist, is to tell a story that saves the fact, i.e. to develop a hypothesis which is consistent with observations. And I said, when you have few observations, there's lots of stories that will save the facts. That will be consistent with the observation. As you develop more and more data, there's a narrowing of the number of, of theories to which will our stories which will say the data. And I said, as we have, as Gene and I have developed more data, our views have come closer and closer together. Thank you.